Um, I'm Richard Aborn. I'm president of the Crime Commission. This is an audience of a lot of friends. This is great. I really appreciate this. Um, I'm very happy. To, I, actually, I got to tell you something funny. Um, Jeremy, Jeremy and I have been friends for a long time, and I love hosting him. I always love hosting him. I, I love the work he does. I love the research that comes out. So we talked about doing this one, and he said, you want to host it again? I said, absolutely. Then I called him back and said, you know what? I really do want to host you, but I want to do it at your house. <laughs> so, so if you ever want to throw a party for your friends, call Jeremy. No. You're going to get a space here. <laughs> so um, this morning is actually a pretty significant morning. And it's significant because I think the data and the research that you're going to hear about today really begins to chronicle and narrate, which is likely the emergence of a new trend in policing. Policing goes through eras from time to time. And we may be going into a new era. In fact, I think we are going into a new era. It's one I like to call precision policing. And what I mean by that is because of a lot of things that police managers have learned and because of technology, we're becoming more skilled at putting cops precisely where they are needed, giving them increasingly the training that they need, and doing what Commissioner Bratton likes to call relentless follow-up when, when these sorts of techniques are applied. All is not perfect. I'm not suggesting all is perfect. There is lots of work still to be done. But the trending analysis is really quite positive. Um, I don't want to get ahead of what the research will show, but some of the data that's already been publicly available shows this remarkable, sharp, sharp, sharp decline in, in the last year or two in, for instance, citizen contact, stops and frisks mostly, and declines in crime. That's an important moment. That's an important moment. And if we can continue that with the kind of policing that's emerging, we will be, in fact, entering a new era. And I think the data that's coming out this morning lays the groundwork for that in an historical context that shows our movement towards it, and certainly in a contemporary context. And it actually expands quite a bit on what I'm talking about. Um, so I'm really very, very happy uh, to be hosting this breakfast this morning. I think it's a very important research uh, piece that's coming out. And I understand you're continuing. Is that right? You're, you're going on. So this is great. So without saying anything further, let me introduce Jeremy. You know, Jeremy really is not someone that needs introduction, particularly to this crowd. But as you know, he's president of John Jay. Uh, his career goes way back in criminal justice. He was with the mayor. He was with the NYPD. He was at NIJ. He was at the Urban Institute. And is now back where he belongs, back in New York. Let's not leave again. Jeremy. So good morning, everyone. It's uh, delightful to have you here in our home. Uh, and uh, it is uh, a true pleasure to be invited here by the Citizens Crime Commission and by my good friend Richard uh, to present this, the, the third report of the Misdemeanor Justice Project. The forum that's provided by the Citizens Crime Commission is the ideal forum for us to present our, our analyses of the data. Uh, because it is a forum of criminal justice experts and practitioners and law enforcement uh, leaders and uh, scholars. And uh, our goal, as you know, if you've been uh, participating in this project over the, over the years in any form, our goal is to inform a uh, discussion, a very important policy uh, discussion. So the Citizens Crime Commission, my uh, gratitude uh, to Richard and his board and uh, to Howard Milstein, who couldn't be here this morning, but for the Milstein Criminal Justice Policy Forum uh, that is the official um, platform on which we're speaking today. Uh, just uh, appreciate it, Richard, and, and love what you're doing at the Citizen Crime Commission, which has got this sort of vitality and uh, reach and uh, impact to the city that's really, really impressive. But what you do best is to bring us together to talk about things, and to talk about things as, as we're seeing changes and as we're seeing new issues uh, on the horizon so that we can, uh, all of us in our different capacities, uh, be uh, better prepared uh, to serve our city. So let me just uh, play historian for a second. Uh, it's n almost three years ago now that uh, Professor Preeti Shohan, who you'll meet in a second and most of you know, uh, she and I, working with a dedicated team of John Jay doctoral students and staff and uh, some 
presidential interns working in my office. Uh, we launched a project and we gave it the name the Misdemeanor Justice Project. So our goal at that time and today remains the same. Uh, it was pretty simple. We wanted to create a capacity, an analytical capacity, for the citizens of the city of New York and our criminal justice uh, and law enforcement leaders and uh, political and elected officials, a capacity to understand the changing nature of enforcement activities in our city. We had noticed, as many of you had, a steady increase in misdemeanor arrests, and we wanted to learn more about that phenomenon. We had remarked on the low level of awareness of another police practice of issuing criminal sum summonses that doesn't get as much attention, but is also experiencing significant shifts in volume. And we were all intensely aware, uh, particularly uh, here at John Jay, many of our students and faculty deeply engaged in the uh, controversy about the steep rise in pedestrian stops known as uh, stop, question, and frisk. So we wanted to bring a, uh, an analytical uh, capacity to understanding these phenomena, bring some hard data into public view in order pr to promote a deeper discussion just in the way that Richard suggested and it's a wonderful introduction to think that, that he is an expert on these issues is seeing something important going on uh, in our city. So as you know, also, the Misdemeanor Justice Project has already produced two reports, one on misdemeanor arrests, one on summonses, both uh, released at forums uh, offered by the Citizens Crime Commission. And we've been very gratified just to be um, uh, expressing my uh, thanks to uh, those who have been involved in this. We've been gratified by the response. Certainly the level of press attention has been gratifying. But more importantly, these reports have come out at a time when there's a very robust policy conversation underway in our city. Uh, just to give you ways that we've uh, seen some of the ripple effects of our work, certainly our first report on, on misdemeanor arrests came out at a time when there was intense focus on uh, quality of life policing uh, in the city, marijuana arrests in particular. Uh, our second report on summonses, we were honored by the presence of uh, Chief Judge Lipman, uh, who at that release of our report talked about his views on uh, the ways in which summonses should be handled in the future, criminal versus uh, administrative forums. So these reports have come at a time and have been used by uh, many to uh, have policy discussions and uh, both Cy Vance and uh, Ken Thompson told me they referred to our summons report in launching their initiatives to help people uh, clear up outstanding warrants. So it's very gratifying. And I just uh, should point out that these issues that we're talking about today also resonate nationally. Uh, so, for example, what is the role these days of broken windows theory uh, and practice in policing? Uh, is there a Ferguson effect, which could be described as a decision or a reluctance by police to uh, uh, reluctance to exercise their enforcement powers? Can the police use their powers to divert cases and individuals? The lead program in Seattle getting a lot of attention at the front door of the justice system. Uh, is an arrest the best way to respond to low-level offenses or people who pose certain problems and have uh, issues of mental health or addiction? What are the downstream costs of making arrests for minor crimes? Intense focus on jails these days in our city and elsewhere. Uh, just to put more, one more question in the air, what, are, what, are, what enforcement strategies are most likely to increase confidence and trust in the justice system, particularly in communities where that confidence and trust has been eroded? So we're not going to answer these questions, but I just want to point out that these are questions that we hope will be informed by our work. On the contrary, in all of the reports that we've released, and we've uh, uh, maintained a, uh, a posture on our work here that's been uh, very uh, important to us, uh, including the one we're releasing today, we just present the facts, we just present the data, we just present the trends. It will leave to others, to you, scholars, practitioners, uh, elected officials, leave the interpretation to you. We don't want to try to explain the causes of these trends, open to debate, nor the relationship between these trends and other important variables, such as crime rates, open to debate, or the ways in which a decline in enforcement action activities has uh, or hasn't increased trust in the police. We leave those discussions to other scholars and experts at other times and in other forums. So what is the report we're releasing today? This third report from the uh, Misdemeanor Justice Project documents trends in a phenomenon, and you see the words we've chosen here, 
that we call enf enforcement rates. So what is an enforcement rate? It's not a, not a common phrase. We've struggled a little bit with it, and we think we've come up with something that is an, an important uh, descriptor. So it's actually pretty simple. It's a calculation of the uh, number of enforcement actions per population. Uh, so for example, we'll look in a second at the level of felony arrests per population rather than the number of felony arrests. So that's an enforcement rate. So this allows us, using a rate, using a denominator of the Census Bureau count of our population, allows us to look at trends over time as the population shifts, the makeup of the population or the numbers of the population. And as you know, there's now a million plus more people living in the city. So you need a, you need a denominator. If you remember your third grade math, you need a denominator to make sense out of this stuff. So we use rates. So we've created this database that has the census data in it so that when we put in the administrative data, the numbers, we can uh, pop out a rate. So uh, you, doing it this way also allows us to talk about a phenomenon such as enforcement rates in the context of subpopulations. So we can now disaggregate a trend by race, <laughs> by gender, by age, when we have those data. And we'll present those today. Because policing is not evenly distributed across the country. So you want to look at the ways enforcement actions are experienced by subpopulations. So this uh, analytical strategy has uh, strengths. It also has limitations. So let me state some of them at the outset. We don't know how many times the same person shows up in our data. So s the same person could be arrested once, get a summons the next time, and be stopped a month later. We don't know that. We don't have the individual identifiers. We also uh, don't know the extent to which the population of the city changes over the hours of the day or days of the week or months of the year. And there's a big influx of commuters that people move around, go from to place to place. So to the extent that we do geographic analysis, which we're not doing here, but we, we have in other reports, we have to acknowledge that we don't have a denominator that reflects the entire uh, population in the city. So nevertheless, we think that the notion of an enforcement rate is really very important uh, metric for, for looking at the police-citizen interaction and to looking at that over time and within subpopulations. So what is the, uh, what was the genesis of this particular report? Because this was not, Freedy <laughs> reminded me uh, this morning, this was not in our original plan. Uh, we, we, have other, we have four other reports underway, one on uh, pretrial detention, one on citizen-initiated versus, citizen versus officer-initiated uh, misdemeanor arrests. We have one on DATs coming out. Uh, and we have a fourth on uh, offender mobility, how do people move around the city. That's our plan. But what happened uh, to uh, set those plans aside was uh, we just watched the numbers. And then we heard uh, Commissioner Bratton uh, on March 26th of this year, make a, a uh, statement quoted in the Daily News uh, in which he said that he predicted a peace dividend of a million fewer stops by the end of 2015. Uh, sorry, not stops, enforcement actions by the end of 2015. Uh, you can look at that quote. I uh, lift some of his language in my introduction in the report. Uh, but that's a big number, a million. Uh, so we wanted to see whether we could help inform a discussion of the peace dividend about what's happening in our city. So uh, obviously, we haven't reached the end of 2015, so we're stopping the clock at the end of 2014, which is when we have our data, uh, to take a look at, at what we found. So hence the title of the report. Uh, we look at data that we have on all enforcement actions, uh, summonses, as you'll see when, when Preeti does the presentation, 2003. So before uh, getting uh, sort of an introduction and then introducing Professor Shohan, let me uh, just say a couple words to our partners. First of all, our data partner to do this uh, work without uh, the data office of court. Soon getting data from the Department of Corrections, so we'll look at uh, pretrial detention over the last uh, two decades. Thanks to the Citizen Crime Commission, uh, Richard and his board in particular, but uh, let me just do a thank you to He's now become a, a part of the canon uh, of the Crime Commission. Really appreciate your, your support and your friendship. Uh, we do this work uh, because we're funded by the Arnold Foundation. Uh, it's the fact power of the work and, uh, of data and, uh, submitted here by the Irvin and Megan Welch. And, uh, of course, is a pre our um, days of the disagreement of the person. So, get down here. So, our friends, we go one step back. So, we found resources to come, let it, my voice, a million. This is a downward slope, uh, so is watershed 
when it's an activity way up, significant. So decades for those of us of a certain age may not seem like that a long time, but I spend a lot of time, my time with 18-year-olds. In this, them, five years of much less enforcement activity compared to five years before that makes a difference in their lives. So that's one way to think about it. It's not across all enforcement categories. Felony arrests have basically stayed flat. Misdemeanor arrests went up and then down. Summonses have basically come down. Stops went way up and then came way down. So we'll document all of that. But the bottom line, we'll see how 2015 sort of tallies up. Uh, but there's something going on here that's important for our city. So now let's, I'm going to set some context. Preeti will show our findings. So here's the context. Just to remind everyone that we live in an era of uh, very low crime rates in New York City, uh, this uh, shows the, uh, the upper line is the decline in uh, property offenses. The bottom one is the decline in violent crimes. Uh, violent crime gets a lot of attention. I think we don't pay enough attention to the fact that property crimes have come down as much as they have. Uh, we always like to look at these uh, as a matter of rate, as I just told you. This is how the same trends look uh, normed by population. So this now has a census data in the base. This is my preferred way of talking about crime rates because it's crime per, per, per geographic area, right? If we lost half our population, we'd say, well, we need to account for that. We've gained population. We need to account for that. But you see the same uh, dramatic trend. So let's now shift gears and look at um, the, what Preeti will show in some uh, detail. This is uh, felony arrests, misdemeanor arrests over this, the period of 1980 to 2014. Wait for summonses, where we have uh, good data. We don't have it before this. Uh, upward slope, downward slope, upward slope, net effect, a big decline in summons activity that we'll talk about in some detail. And here's the uh, big one. So this is stop, question, and frisk activity as measured by 250s, a form filled out by police officers that issue a stop. Uh, we don't know if this is all recording all stops. I'm certain it's not. Uh, but these are the official data uh, that come from the police department that now made public. So we're at the, at the right side of that chart. We're looking at the decade of 2003 uh, to 2015 and tracking the increase and the decrease. There it is by rates. Same thing now by rates. Okay, so rates will be the way we talk about this from here on out, right? I think so. Okay, pretty. It's for, it's yours. I'm not pretty, <laughs> but pretty needs an introduction. Um, pretty is our our star presenter. Um, I always embarrass her because I always tell her that, but it's so true. Uh, she's a professor here. Um, she did her schooling first in Florida, then at the University of Virginia, where she got her doctorate. Um, she's worked at various institutions, both in New York and other places. Um, she is one of the finest presenters of sometimes very complicated data that I frankly have ever seen, and I see a lot of presentations. So I'm thrilled that you're back with us this morning. Please come up. Nice Nothing like setting the bar really high, right? Um, <laughs> Thank you, Richard, for allowing us to release this third report at the Citizens Crime Commission, and also to Howard Milstein for letting us use this criminal justice policy forum for the breakfast. So as you have had a preview, I will be presenting enforcement rates over the course of 12 years in New York City. But before I get into enforcement rates, I want to talk a little bit about what different types of enforcement actions we have in New York City, and there are a lot of different ones. <coughs> There's felony arrests, misdemeanor arrests. Those occur everywhere, and they're pretty global. There's reported stop, question, and frisk, also pretty global. But in New York City, we have various different types of summonses. So the first is criminal summonses. Criminal summonses given for low-level violations of administrative codes, penal law, health codes, vehicle and traffic laws, among others. And criminal summonses are generally given for public consumption of alcohol, disorderly conduct, public urination, to name a few. Then there's also what's not going to be in included in our analyses, but we think is a sizable amount of enforcement action violations. So these are given for disobeying a traffic sign, using your cell phone while driving, not wearing a seatbelt. And you'll see that this is a pretty sizable chunk in a little bit. Parking violation summonses and transit authority bureau summonses given on subways. So our fees, for the most part, will only capture the, the, last, the top four, excuse me, because that's what we have reliable data on. 
Um, the, uh, the bottom three we do not have on them. And as you've already gotten a preview, what we'll see is that over time, their enforcement actions pretty dramatic. And as you've already seen, primarily the second two, misdemeanor arrests and seizures. But with story, more um, smaller stories. The first being that there's a lot of within demographic group changes and it's not uniform. So by that I mean not everyone experiences all decreases. Men and young people experience pretty dramatic increases and then decreases, as did blacks and Hispanics compared to whites. So there's a lot of within group fluctuation. There's also a lot of between group fluctuation. And what I mean by that is the different demographic groups, um, the, the between them is, has varied over time. What we will see, the disproportionate rate for men and women decreased over time. The gender gap is being narrow. The general story is that the decreases from that more as we get into the numbers. Obviously alluded to, but there's thousand enforcement actions in 2014, about 3,000 So first, um, before I get into I want to just show you numbers. And this, this is going to highlight that we're missing a significant number of types of enforcement. So the green line on the bottom, number of felony arrest rates over the course of these four years, 90,000 remains relatively stable. This blue line, um, which is the number, and the number you see on top is the number of misdemeanor arrests, it, you see that it's gone down over these four years, but still less than a half a million. It's the C summonses, which is the red bar, and we see that this has also gone down, going from about a half a million to 370,000. Still, all three of them combined, less than one million enforcement actions. And this is where we have data on moving violation summonses. And this is approximately one million enforcement actions a year that we are not capturing with our data because we don't have reliable data. Uh, but this also shows that um, this is a pretty sizable type of enforcement action. You add all four of these up, we're still below two million. This is stops. And we see it goes from about 685,000 at its peak to less than 50,000 in 2014, a 93% decrease over this time span. And when we add it all up, we see we go from about 2.6 million enforcement actions to 1.8 million over this pretty small time span. Now let's get into the rates. So as has been said, the rates are all of our enforcement actions added up. So you'll see it's felony arrest, misdemeanor arrest, C summonses and stops divided by the population. Um, as we said, there are limitations to this. We acknowledge that this is not per person. So we know that in a given incident, a person can get multiple, up to 10 summonses in one, for one incident. Um, a, in a given year, a person can get stopped, arrested, and receive a C summons, or in a given year, a person can be stopped multiple times. So we cannot account for this at the individual level. So there's a lot of lines up here, so let me explain what those are. The bottom lines are the four individual enforcement actions, the green always being felony arrest, the blue always being misdemeanor arrest, the red C summonses, and then the orange, the stops, the one with the most fluctuation. The top line, the yellow line on top, is those added up. And what we see essentially is that we see a significant increase from 2003 to 2011, and then a 50% drop from 2011 to 2014. And I want to point out here, and you'll see this in other figures too, that the stop rate is now lower than the felony arrest rate in 2014. Going forward, I'm going to break this down by demographics, but this top line that you see is going to be a dotted line in, 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 um, in the figures going forward to provide a reference point to how these different demographics compare to New York City enforcement rate as a whole. So how does this look by gender? And we see that a lot of this fluctuation is really comprised of men. So the New York City reference line is the dotted black line, and we see that men have a much higher rate of enforcement compared to New York City as a whole. Again, driven mainly by stops. This is women, and we see that this is relatively low and flat compared to men. And then how do the enforcement rates between men and women compare? So in 2003, um, it was a 10 to 1 ratio. And this, over time, has decreased. 
and is consistently decreasing. So the, infor the difference or the gap between men and women is decreasing in terms of the enforcement rate. And how does this break down by age? We use five age groups, and I'll, I'll show them to you as we go. Um, the first is 16 to 17 year olds, this red line. And we see a massive increase, more than doubles, followed by a more than 60% decrease from 2011 to 2014. And we see that this is much higher than the New York City enforcement rate. And let's compare that to our, our age group 35 and older, which is the solid black line, which consistently has the lowest enforcement rate. And we see that there's a big difference between 16 to 17 year olds and 35 and older. This difference goes, increases from 2003 to 2011, and then subsequently decreases. Those are the ratios that you see on the left. Blue line is 18 to 20 year olds. This is the age group that we consistently see the highest enforcement actions among. Um, and we see it follows a pretty similar pattern to 16 and 17 year olds, and they, they do tend to converge towards 2014. And in terms of the ratio, 18 to 20 year olds compared to 35 and older, the gap increases from 2003 to 2011 and then subsequently decreases. 21 to 24 year olds, not quite as high, not as dramatic of an increase. And also we see that by 2014, the three age groups are converging in terms of their enforcement rate. And in terms of the gap or the ratio, similar pattern, increase from 2003 to 2011, and then a subsequent decrease. And lastly, the 25 to 34 year olds who closely track with the New York City enforcement rate, they're still a little bit higher, nothing as dramatic as the younger age groups. But again, what we see is that the age groups are converging, especially the younger age groups by 2014. Next, we want to look at enforcement rates by race and ethnicity. And going forward, this won't include C summonses because we don't have reliable data on race and ethnicity in the C summons database. So the dotted black lines that you'll see going forward don't actually include um, the C summons enforcement rate. So it'll be felony arrest, misdemeanor arrest, and um, stops. So first, this is the enforcement rate uh, for from 2003 to 2013 by race and ethnicity, and that purple line is the black enforcement rate, again using the two arrest types and stops. And we see that it more than doubles to, um, more than doubles from 2003 to 2011, and then drops by over 60%. We also see that it is much higher than the New York City enforcement rate, so for all individuals who are for felony arrest, misdemeanor arrest, and stops. And the light blue line on the bottom is the enforcement rate for whites, and we see that whites are lower than the New York City enforcement rates, and obviously lower than the black enforcement rate. And in terms of the difference, so the difference in the enforcement rate for black compared to white, what we see is that ratio increases or the gap increases from 2003 to 2011 and then subsequently decreases from 2011 to 2014, but still higher than the 2003 starting point. The green line is the Hispanic enforcement rate, and we see that the increases, decreases, not nearly as high, but still doubled. And the, in terms of the difference or the gap, we see a similar pattern. Next, we wanted to see how the various enforcement rates break down by race and ethnicity. So this is the enforcement rate for, um, for the 12 years for blacks. The top line, again, is the added enforcement rate of the two types of arrests and stops. And we see that a lot of the variability increases and decreases are due to summonses and the reduction in summonses. Again, here, the stop rate is lower than the felony rate. And we see over a 60% decrease from 2011 to 2014, but also a doubling of the enforcement rate from 2003 to 2011. This is for Hispanics, and this is a similar pattern. Um, more than doubles from 2003 to 2011, and then drops by more than 60% from 2011 to 2014. And again, much of it due to the variation in stock. And this is for whites. 
who remain relatively low compared to the other age groups. I'm sorry, compared to the other race groups. Next, we're going to show you the enforcement rates for men, because we saw that it was mainly men that were driving this phenomenon um, by race and ethnicity, as well as age. So how does this break apart by age and race? First, we look at our youngest age group, the 16 to 17 year olds. And what we see here is over 100 percent, over 130 percent increase from 2003 to 2011 in terms of the enforcement rate, followed by an over about a 70 percent decrease from 2011 to 2014. And here you will see that the enforcement rate at its peak in 2011 is 136 percent. So this highlights that we're not getting individual level data, but we're just considering the population base. This black dotted line is the enforcement rate for all individuals, men and women, in New York City. So we see that these young men are substantially higher than the New York City enforcement rate using these three metrics. And this light blue line is young 16 to 17 year old white men. And we see that up until 2011, the white men in, that are in this age group are higher than the New York City enforcement rate, but they ultimately converge in the last four years. And what is, what is the difference between the black enforcement rate and the white enforcement rate? Here we see a slightly different pattern in that the gap continues to decrease, I mean increase from 2011 to 2014, to, 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 to 2014. So it increases from 2003 to 2011 and rather than going down with this age group, it continues to decrease. The difference in the enforcement rate continues to decrease. And for Hispanics, we see a similar trend. Even in, in, in both in terms of the increases and the decreases, but also in terms of the gap or the ratio. So how does this look with 18 to 20 year olds? Again, massive increases, more than a 140% increase from 2003 to 2011, huge. And then drops by over 70% from 2011 to 2013. Here, the enforcement rate in 2011 at its peak is 156% for this age group. This is how the black dotted line, again, New York City, so substantially higher than the New York City enforcement rate using these metrics. And the white men are also higher um, using these metrics than the New York City enforcement rate, but they start to converge by 2014 with the New York City enforcement rate. So what about the difference? What does the difference between the two demographics look like with this? So here we see from 2003 to 2011, the gap increases and then it decreases, but it's still higher than the 2003 starting point. And with the Hispanics, we see a similar pattern. 21 to 24 year olds, again, not as massive of an increase, not as massive of a decline, but still substantial variability. Still higher than the New York City enforcement rate and the white men in this age group generally just parallel the New York City enforcement rate. What about the difference between these two groups? Again, the difference increases from 2003 to 2011 and then subsequently decreases, but it's still higher than the 2003 turning starting point. And we see the same thing for Hispanics. I'm just gonna pull this up. Here we see essentially a similar pattern. Here, this age group, 25 to 34 year olds, are slightly lower than the New York City enforcement rate. The black 25 to 34 year old men are still higher than the New York City enforcement rate. And the gap between them increases from 2003 to 2011 and then subsequently decreases. And we see a similar pattern for Hispanics. Our last age group, relatively low, stable as we saw earlier. And we see, though, that they're still higher than the New York City enforcement rate. The white men in this age group lower than the New York City enforcement rate. And the gap, again, increases from 2003 to 2011, subsequently decreases, but still higher than the starting point. And same thing for Hispanic. Hispanic men in this group closely parallel the New York City enforcement rate, but the gap, again, increases and then decreases. So I've showed you a lot of stuff. <laughs> Lots of figures, lots of numbers, lots of graphs. But here are the take-home messages again. One is that we saw these massive, massive shifts 
and they're primarily due to stops, but increases in C summonses and misdemeanor arrests as well. And there were two um, sub stories in there. The first is that not all the not all the different demographics experience the same increases and decreases. Men and young people experience the most changes, and young men of color experience the most dramatic changes. And in terms of the difference between these enforcement rates, um, the gender gap has decreased. And in most instances for the age, the, the gap among the younger age, age group compared to the 35 and older increased from 2003 to 2011, but then subsequently decreased. We saw the same with the race and ethnicity, minority men compared to whites, but in the 16 to 17 year old age group, the, the gap continued to increase from 2011 to 2014. That one did not go down. And as you saw, there were about 800,000 fewer enforcement actions from 2011 to 2014. So what are our next steps? We want to continue to monitor this. We want to see if the one, there will be 1 million fewer enforcement actions at the end of 2015. So we want to see what this looks like by the, with the data for next year. And as was um, previously mentioned, we're going to be doing four additional analyses, which we're very excited about. Uh, the first is using Department of Correction data to look at pretrial detention over 20, possibly 25 years. And this we will be able to do at an individual level. So we will be actually be able to see how many people are going in and out of the pretrial detention over the course of this 20 years. We're also going to look at officer-initiated versus citizen-generated arrests at the release of our first report. That was the first question we had was, do we know this? And we don't know this, but we want to find out because it's an important policy question. So which misdemeanor arrests are initiated by a citizen with a victim or a complainant? versus initiated by a police officer. Next, also with our first report, we noticed that there was a lot of mobility among people who were getting arrested for misdemeanors. They weren't getting, a sizable portion weren't getting arrested in their same patrol borough that they live in. So we want to look to see where they're going, what they're getting arrested for, and when they're going. So is it weekends, weekdays, parades, etc. cetera. Um, and then we saw massive variation in the issuance of desk appearance tickets. So for a misdemeanor arrest, you get a DAT instead of having to wait for a judge to get arraigned. At, um, in 1999, that was 8%. In 2013, that was 38%. So a huge increase in the number and the proportion of people getting DATs. And we want to get a better understanding of that because that has some real, real life implications for people who don't have to wait to get arraigned. Um, and with that, I will turn it over to Richard for questions. So was I right? Is she not the clearest thing on the face of the earth? Um, I'm actually just going to invite questions and invite you both to come back up um, in case there are any questions. Are there any? It's Friday, so maybe, maybe not. Friday morning. Okay. Um, if not, I, th I told you you were clear. <laughs> this happened last time, too. I, I just have one. It's really technical. The um, next four reports you're doing, are you doing them in the order you put them up? No. Um, Good, because we're going to negotiate. <laughs> <laughs> I think what we're hoping to do is the DAT one first, because we have the data ready for oh. that. And the analysis will be fairly simple, and then we'll sort of proceed from there. Okay. Yeah. All right. Yes. I have a mic. Um, I noticed in the report that um, moving violations are um, were approximately 58% of the um, the enforcement actions in 2014. So I'm wondering, how representative do you think the rest of the data is in your study, considering that more than half of the data is missing? I mean, it's not representative, but we we work with what we have. And 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 the other thing about the moving violations is that at least for those four years, they were relatively stable. So there wasn't these massive increases or decreases in those four years. So we, I mean, it's it's not an easy assumption to make that they've been stable prior to that. But at least for those four years, they were stable. Okay. Thank you all very, very much. Let me wish you a wonderful holiday and a good new year. And we will see you in January. Thanks all. Thank you.